the de democratic deficit that we are facing in Pakistan by getting our voices heard. And to do that, we have to try to invite some speakers, some journalists like Mujahid, some politicians, judges, and academics. Um, we are a group of around 15 students who started this, and we plan to be having your events stand for throughout the year. So we would like to uh, like you to follow us as well. Um, we are very grateful to Mujahid for agreeing to come to this. And he is uh, one of our first speakers over here in this project, so we are uh, really moved by his gesture. Although he was there for a very short, a short time, but he did take uh, you know, a generous amount of time, of course. So we are grateful for that. Uh, Wajahat is, like everyone knows, he is our favorite bloody civilian. <laughs> he has been uh, reporting on military, he has been reporting, reporting on politics, he's been criticized in the past as well, but he's also loved by a lot of people. He was nominated for an Emmy Award, and you know, um, he has studied from Columbia as well. He is, is you know, part of a lot of think tanks, rights on Pakistan, rights on international politics. So I would like to give the floor to Mujahid now, <laughs> with a, um, so that he can you know give us some context of what's happening in Pakistan, and then we can do a small Q and A with me, and then we open the floor for questions. Thank you. Very bad with introductory uh, remarks. Uh, only the most uh, uh, traumatized experience of my recent life is uh, Pakistan's performance versus Afghanistan. As of two hours ago, I am um, in a very bad mood uh, because of that. So uh, I have nothing much to say beyond uh, the team's uh, performance at this rate. However, I'm really hoping, uh, first of all, that this more of this happens. Um, it's important uh, for the academy, the Pakistan academy, whether it's back home, whether it's in this place, whether it's in any other country. I think the academy has a special place, a very understudied place in uh, Pakistan's history. I must remind all of you uh, that uh, the term Pakistan was invented by around four or five students at Cambridge who had a big uh, pub lunch and uh, then uh, packed away, uh, got a takeaway bag and went to, left the pub and went to the, the bank uh, of the River Thames and chilled out on the sunny afternoon and came up with that term. Students have been at the core of uh, uh, the ideology of Pakistan, the Pakistan movement. Uh, Allah my father was a student there, not here but in this country, uh, when he came up with his bright ideas, which we are of course going to debate. Um, that can be debated as well. Of course, Kajazan wasn't a student, but uh, was, uh, um, was up to his bar and um, his other lawyering when, uh, when he came up with his solution to the problem. Uh, that was uh, a divided versus united India at that point. I think it's really important to remember the role of students, especially British Pakistani or British Asian students who have played a role in this country's not these fundamentals through history. So I'm very glad. Thank you for, for doing this. You are a part of a great movement. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I wanted to start off this conversation by you know by requesting you to give us a bit of history of this you know term that we hear quite often in our news circles. And that term is civil military imbalance. It's something that you know we uh, you know heard of growing up for I'm 27, so I've heard this for almost three decades, and you know, people who are older than me have been hearing it for <laughs> much longer. So please give us a, you know, the youngest students a bit of context about this, and also the present uh, situation in Pakistan regarding this. Okay, so I'm just going to do like very really Twitter-sized responses, and because you guys are clearly, you guys have had enough lectures for the day, all right? So, so basically, the the go-to book uh, to really uh, kick off your experiences about the civil military imbalance is Hussain Khani's last book, right? Where he uh, says it very simply. He says when the when partition happened, the this weird rule was followed and it's been done in movies, it's been covered by Manjo, but Hussein Hakani really breaks it down uh, very academically. He says that and by the way Hussein Hakani I know is a controversial figure and I saw some people raising their eyebrows. This is not about Hussein Hakani the ambassador, this is about Hussein Hakani the academic and there is a difference, right? Because he's, he's a very good academic, he might not have been a very good ambassador, that's a whole other story, you can invite him and take it from there. 
However, the Senate kind of says that when the Badwara happened, uh, as many people call it, there was a rule, there was a 15, 20% rule, Pandra B speaks of rule, right? So Pakistan, or whatever was Pakistan at that point, got 15, 20%, while the Indians got 80, 85% of everything. Literally everything. The bureaucracy, uh, the treasury, of course, the land mass, right? That was, a, that was a broad rule. But the one rule uh, which was not followed, the, the 15, 20% one area where the 15, 20% rule was not followed was for the ground forces, for the army. And a good 30, 35% of army units, right? I know the army is a big, huge animal, but it was a big, huge animal to begin with. And it's quite inexplicable, and I use that term in its essence. It can't be explained why there were three armed forces. There was a British Royal Air Force at that time, which became the Royal Pakistani Air Force. There was the Royal British Navy, which became the Royal Pakistan Navy, and there was the Pakistan Army. So there were three branches of the armed forces. The Air Force didn't get its fair share. It was also a victim of the Pandra B. Spisa, the 15, 20%. So was the Navy also. In fact, the Navy was the least, which I don't know who does Pandra B. Spisa because the coastlines were guaranteed as a promotion of the coastline near Maris as I'm recommending. But effectively, for no odd reason, which there was very good reasons then to begin with, you see it through history, the, the army itself versus the other armed forces was, was uh, skewed to begin with. And that's where the civil military imbalance really begins. And of course, it gets compounded. It gets compounded for several reasons. It gets compounded in the 50s with Sender Mirza, who was a former army officer. It gets compounded in the late 50s with the Yub Khan. And the rest remains history. But one of the first things Yub Khan did when he came, this is an internal thing, it's not an external thing, but it explains how even within the armed forces there was an imbalance. So where there's enough bloody civilians in the room for me not to bore you with the, with the nuances of the civil military imbalance. But what about the army versus the air force versus the navy imbalance. And guess what? There is an imbalance. Because one of the first things that you did was that the, the coat of arms in, in the context of the, uh, the Pakistan armed forces, the three services, which had been inherited by the Brits, the coat of arms used to say navy, army, air force in that order because the navy is the oldest service. The Brits got to India via the navy. Was a man named Forge Niyasi, Forge Navy Life. The Navy in India was the senior service. So, in the Court of Arms, in the Order of Battle, as it's called, I mean, Forge is the one over wrong. The Order of Battle was the, it was the Navy, Army, and then that was the new service. It was a 20th century service. They hadn't invented planes then, right? But eventually, when they did, uh, the, the Air Force is naturally the third and most junior service. And you changed that. So, he changed Navy, Army, Air Force to Army. Navy, Air Force. And that took an effect in every way. Budgeted, politically, bureaucratic. So even, forget you guys, you guys are bloody civilians, you don't matter, right? Even within the uniformed armed forces, there was an inbuilt uh, mechanism of biasness uh, entertained and then uh, executed by that first dictatorship. So that's the context of civil military balance, and then we can go blow by blow, decade by decade, day by day, into how that imbalance has only been further and continues to be further even today. Uh, we would like you to give us a brief recap of <laughs> the tussles that prime ministers have gotten in historically with the um, with the chief of army staff, so that you know, we can get to the current crisis as well. What do you mean? By so we can start off by from the. 60s, how, sorry, 50s, I think it was late 50s, when Eskandar Mirza was sent home. We can start off from there, then we can uh, carry on to um, Ziyar's era, Yahya's era, Ayub's, uh, sorry, uh, Yahya's era, and then Musharraf's, and then we come to General Bajwa. Just briefly. Right, so let's just really work, instead of working uh, 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 backward, let's just move forward, or maybe perhaps start in the middle. So, how many people here think that Pakistan was made in 1947? Just one? Really? Come on, guys. How many people agree with the thesis that Pakistan was made in 1947? And that's 
still in touch with the same. He's only six years old, right? I mean, come on. What are you just keeping? Come on, wake up, man. Was it made in 47? Yes. Yes. Can I get a yes? Yes. I disagree. Are you talking about the idea of No, I'm talking about the, the Islamic Republic of Pakistan as we know it. So, no, as it's taught to us. No, I disagree. I respectfully disagree. I think that the current version of Pakistan that you are related to, interested in studying from, whatever, the current version of Pakistan was founded somewhere in the early 70s. Because that version of Pakistan, which was thought of here when Alama did his thing and uh, uh, Rehmat Ali did his thing and Jinnah did his thing, that version of Pakistan died in December 1971. Just died, right? That was a uh, version of a unionized West East Wing. We've talked about this, we know this, but the biggest, the biggest, uh, I guess you can say, victim of that was at that time the Pakistan army, half of which, most of which, was taken prisoner of war at that time. As far as I'm concerned, Pakistan's first constitution is not the one that you came up in the 50s or the other one they came up in the 60s with. We've had three constitutions. The last one is the first one, the 1973 one. As far as I'm concerned, Bhutto was the first president of Pakistan, this Pakistan, this nuclear Pakistan. Because what you see really is a tilt, a pivot, immediate, stark, populist, nuclear, Islamist, Bhutto, Zia, everybody else, trying to rebrand the country. The name was restarted, Islamic Republic of Pakistan. Nuclear weapons were made as a statute of, as a pillar of national security. The army never stopped backing down. Populism meant uh, religious extremism, with enemies being shafted in one area. The Shalmaratini is being used as another uh, uh, a hallmark of nationalism. The holiday on, 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 on Fridays being inducted. And those are the last days of disco, as my, my parents call it, right? That is, those are the last days where those swinging grandparents and parents of ours used to go to nightclubs and, and stuff. All of that stuff, you heard those stories. Because the old Pakistan never worked, because what India had done, and the Bengal, with, with, well, the Bengalis had done with some help from India, to be fair. The Bengalis had done with some help from India and then buried the two nations there. Now, premised on that, the, the comeback, the brutal, savage comeback that the populists tried to make, first, first, by a, that, 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 the, that the national security state tries to make, is first by a populist, pushed by Bhutto, who then starts experimenting with religious extremism. It was Bhutto who started a lot of this. Sure. He, Perhaps didn't do it as well as yeah, yeah, really took it forward to the next level. But as far as I'm concerned, this modern version of Pakistan, as we know it, geographically, <coughs> spatially, politically, was born in 1971. We are not 30, uh, 76 years old. We are 52 years old, as far as I'm concerned, 53 years old. And premised on that, it's more important for me to give examples of the civil-military breakdown from that, because since then it's been quite obvious. If you really even, if you say Asham Jab, you're full of, you know, SHI dot dot dot, right? We are, let's just convene the whole thing. Then you can see really clear markers, almost on a 10 year cycle. The first 10 years are uh, post Jinnah, the first 10 years are from 47 to 58. What would one call it? But bureaucracy meets technocracy. Didn't work. The next 10 years, 58 to 69. Rough, more or less, like that, you see proper, very British Sandhurst autocracy. The next 10 years, that there's that little brutalized war in the middle, brutalizing war in the middle. And the next 10 years, what do you see? You see this democratic autocracy with Woodrow. And the next 10 years, from 77, 78, right till 1988, you see, again, this experiment with autocracy. From that era, from the late 80s, right to 1999, 88 to 99, you again see an experimentation with this weird hybrid democratic model that the soldiers, as well as the judiciary, used to blame as well. But the next 10 years, from 88 to 99, is that. And then, from 99 to 2008, the next 10 years, you again see this weird enlightened moderation autocracy, and then literally, to the date, to the T, from, 19, uh, from, uh, from 1999 to 2008, you see that, and from 2008 till now, you are seeing the breakdown, you see Imran Khan tops it all off at 2019, this is a new, now they're calling it hyper-democracy, that doesn't work 
two. So you literally can chunk off Pakistan in nine, 10, nine, 10, maybe 11 year gaps. And you can see that we are at the beginning of the next decade experiment. And that's, that's where we're at. That's the civil military balance. But the one thing I will tell you is that there's a pub quiz I play with my friends uh, when we've had a little too much. I'm going to ask all of you, right? <laughs> there's a pub quiz I play. And it's like, what's the common theme? What's the common theme between the world's five or six largest um, political economies? Now, let's name them, right? Uh, there's uh, there's uh, the US, of course. Um, there's China. Um, there's Russia, uh, there's India, there's Germany, and there's Japan. In my opinion, this is, this is my game, so you play that game, right? If we can argue for the Brits to be there, but they've been replaced uh, economically by the Indians now as the world's fifth largest economy. So, what's the common thing? Go. Military. What military? The, the Japanese have self defense forces, not the new military. Go ahead. Good shot, What's the common thing? What rule of law? In India, still struggling with rule of law? Democracy? Who said democracy? China is a democracy? Wow, I really want to smoke, but you're smoking. <laughs> hold on, hold on, hold on. Economic growth. I'm sorry, but the Chinese just saw that boom like 15 years ago. The Indians have just got it now. They were starving. They had parity with us in the 80s. It's not economic boom. Now they're all booming, which has put India on this my top six list. What is it? No interference on the military. Have you heard of the People's Liberation Army? Mm -hmm. But this is part of the system. It is the system, sir. <laughs> no, I will not take that as an answer. It's the world's largest military. It runs that country. Sir? On ideology. What ideology? What ideology do the Japanese have? You're on to something. Here. Talk to me. Tell me more. What ideology do the Americans have? Okay, keep going to communism in China, keep going. Yeah, what about the poor Germans? Germans are not much about this, but about this. Americans, you can say they have the industrial complex, they have the got money and capitalism as well. Okay, but that but those are very different ideologies, man. But look, yeah, even the the, yeah, but the, the, that's not common between them. Everybody has their own ideology. We're trying to find a common thread, yeah. A popular premier. A what what? A popular premier. A popular premier. Uh, wow, okay. Um, give me an example. Who's been popular? Modi is popular. The Japanese have had 23 prime ministers in the last 15, 20 years. Nobody's been popular. They've got a, pop they've got a prime minister problem. So do we. <laughs> <laughs> huh? Oh, which same political party? Ah, oh, but that's one. That's one, but still, it, it doesn't explain his thesis. It doesn't explain his thesis that they've had popular governments. What is it? And by the way, the, I can tell you right off the bat that the Chinese leadership is, is feared, is more feared than it is popular. So, I will cut it short and I will run you through the list. It's nothing except one thing. But first, let's check off everything. So, the army, the uh, different countries have different armies. Some have nuclear weapons, some don't. Some like to attack, some don't. Some like to defend. Some have an intervention. It's not a foreign policy. Some have a very interventionist foreign policy like the Americans do. Some don't, right? Um, some, uh, it's definitely not democracy, right? I mean, America just gave the vote, really, to uh, black people in the 60s, right? The Chinese still haven't given the vote. Uh, definitely not parity of governments uh, in terms of the LDP is very different from the, 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 the Republican Party or whoever's government. Uh, America. So, what is it? In my humble opinion, and I'm ready to be taken on with this thesis anytime, but I've won every pub quiz I've ever, I've ever had, I've ever held. In my humble opinion, the common thread between the world's top six largest economies, political economies, let's just be honest, the Russians are too big, right, is that by the first 50, 60 years or so of the founding, the Americans were founded when? 1976. Good man. Late 1700s. The Indians were founded when? 47. They were founded in 47. We won. Right. right? The Chinese were founded a year later. The modern German state, as we know it, was founded then as well. Right? The Russians, as far as this, this, this 
this uh, infrastructure of the Russian state is concerned, I still count it as a um, uh, as born of the Russian Revolution in 1912. I still count it as that because that's how they work. They work like a police state, right? So it can't be how old they are. It's definitely not their military might. It's definitely not uh, their foreign policy. It's definitely not their democratic ideals because some happen, some don't. So, and it's definitely not their, uh, their, their economic model because the Indians only opened up the economy in 1991. The Chinese did a year later. So what is it? In my humble opinion, and this is where Pakistan has missed the boat, that in the first five or six decades, seven decades in some cases, after the founding, all of these countries were ruled by hook or by crook, by one party. By right or by might, by vote or by ballot or by blood or by the sword, one party, one system ruled these countries. The communists still rule China. The LDP still runs Japan. The CDP is the dominant party in, in Germany's history. The KGB still runs uh, Russia in, under a different name, but they're still in charge. And, and before they had their civil war, the Americans were effectively a one-party state where there was a lot of crossover. So you could call it that it was the Republicans and Democrats, but really they were one. One party. Internecine warfare is a lot of party in Islam, only civil war can But it was all white men who were running that country together as a post-colonial state. And that is my thesis for Pakistan where the bus has gone, the boat has sailed. Because as I've broken down, you had, had a 10 year gap, literally had a nice 10 year slices. You can literally slice up the last 70 years in those 10 year chunks and you can see that we have in the first 10 years been a bureaucratic technocracy, in the next 10 years we've been a, a modern autocracy, in the next 10 years we've been this populist democracy, in the next 10 years we've been this Islamist uh, autocracy, then in the next 10 years we're this hybrid democracy, and then in the next 10 years we're this enlightened, moderated autocracy, and then now we are a complete shit show. So, yes? That is a separate question and, and a, that, that is the, that is the topic. But yes, the is it is tofe se baat bani ke sab mein jo aapki baat hai achhi achhi baat hai ke sab mein ab sawal banta hai ki acha the vote has failed for us. Hum na communist hain, hum na democrat hain, hum na republican hain, hum na kuch bhi. Hum kya hain? Well, the good news for you is, especially for you, is that in this entire complete disaster of a Frankenstein, jo aada tita re aada bade re phir tita ro jata hai, thodi moli bhi dal deta hai, right? ये जो सत्तर साल की जो एक्सपेरिमेंटेशन है इस सब में the one common thread, the most important institution, the most significant, the most powerful, the most intimidating, the most the one with the most capacity to kill, to plot, to engineer, to enforce legally or illegally is the army, and you are stuck with it, and that is why we must now start talking about reform. From within, from within the military, we have to start talking about reform. Because I guess, guess what? Guess what's going to happen tomorrow if the aliens abduct Imran from Adiala, right? And Nawaz decides to star in a Bollywood flick and move to India, and Asim Zardari goes golfing with his supermodel girlfriends in Emirates Hills, right? And moves to Dubai. And you are left, this entire Nizam is just lost. Despite of that, you'll still have the elephant in the room, will still be the world's fifth largest army, which is trained, primed, and in fact expects you to let it run the state without you, without, without, well, any oversight. So, where does that oversight begin? It has to begin from within the army. There are other examples of how, from our region, of how the army itself has slowly, gradually, for the sake of, of, of national sovereignty, for the sake of national economy, given up. It's given up its powers. There are examples. We can type, we can we can talk about those examples, like Indonesia. But my bottom line um, for everyone is that 
you need to, you're stuck with the army, the other parties will come and go. We can talk about the new league in a bit as well, because that is the second most powerful institution. In this 70, 76 year old cycle, if the army is the first most important institution which has sustained itself, then the new league is the second most powerful institution, because it's been running the show since the 40s in the country's largest province. And that gives it not just votes, it might not be popular, but it is powerful. There is a difference. That's, that's my thesis on, on, on that. Well, enough to speak about uh, reforms from within, uh, the need for reforms from within the art institution. But how can those reforms take place when you know the absolute powers, the power lies in the hand of one person? And he's the one who appoints the people left and right to him. And you know, uh, recently you did some coverage about some uh, two stars becoming three stars and how many people were jumped over. So when such absolute powers are given in the hands of one person, why would that person want to let them go? Good question. So that is exactly what the Indonesians did. Right, so the Indonesians ruled Indonesia, the Indonesian military ruled Indonesia for almost 40 years, and then after the last dictatorship, they said, "All right, we need to talk because we're going to miss this boat, this Asian tiger boat, which which uh, Nawaz Sharif talks a lot about." In the late 90s, who was alive in the late 90s? Everybody was alive. Who was reading? Who was reading newspapers? Who was reading the Economist in the late 90s? Except, okay, so I'm clearly the only nerd in the room, right? So, so they, they didn't cover. Right on the Asian Tigers, they, I think they came up with the term that magazine because the Indonesians saw the Malaysians next door, the Singaporeans, uh, the Taiwanese, the South Koreans do really well, and they were doing really well because they were with the times. They didn't have, they didn't have. Sure, they have strong militaries. The Singaporeans have a draft system, in fact, but the the Indonesians didn't want to miss the boat. There was a, there was a sort of an economic boom in the region, and they said we want in. For that, they needed guys. They needed bloody civilians to actually run things properly. And they reached a compromise with the government. After the dictatorship which came in, the government that they chose said, all right, how are we going to do this? You guys are used to power. You get to How are we going to do this? The Indonesian military said, you tell us. Yes, And the new guy who came in, he said, well, uh, how about, instead of choosing just the chief, I choose the top 10, 15 commanders as well. So that, you know, we're all happy, so you're not just powerful, but everybody's sort of like on the same table. Sort of like Arthur and his round table. That awesome legend which came from this very country. Right? And guess what? That's what happened. There was a King Arthur, he was kind of a civilian, and he had a very round table of commanders. And he could choose, at that point, and they've continued with the system, they can choose junior level commanders. So your, the show you are referring to, which I did a few weeks ago, which you must watch, is that the core command, who are the core commanders? I broke it down. Did everybody see that show? Well, you should. It's on my live, right? It's on my site. So who are the core commanders? Well, the army chief doesn't run it himself. This is the world's third largest army. The army chief has an office, right next to his office is a secretary. Right next to the secretary is a uh, uh, secretary, secretary, right? He doesn't have these nine, ten guys sitting right next to him. They're out in Quetta, they're out in Peshawar. So let's understand how the military works, first of all. So to your point, yes, the army chief is all powerful, but then there's a compendium of commanders who only report to him. The Indonesians changed that. They changed the nature of the command system. They, changed, they didn't change the nature of the army in terms of uh, um, the day-to-day -day functions of the army, the commanders were reporting to the army chief. But because the army was so entrenched in the larger system, the best at the top were chosen by the civilian system. Because they're not just commanders, they're politicians, they're stakeholders. They effectively serve like chief ministers. The core commander of Quetta runs that province. Who is supposed to run that province, the chief minister? Do you know his name? No. Do you know the core commander's name? Yes, Asimov. Same goes with the guy who runs Peshawar. Same goes with the guy who runs Karachi, right? He's the most powerful guy in the office, in, in that province. So they said, let's pick this guy and work with him. So the army did have to give the Indonesian, the elected Indonesian government, a bit of a leeway to come inside, come into our core commander's conference, sit down. And, and that's where the change began. The result is obvious, the rest is history. Indonesia has caught up, did catch up with the rest of the Asian Tigers. Is one of the world's biggest economies right now, just close to the G20 last year, and we are where we're at. But somebody had to make the first move. 
And in terms of reform, they had to rethink. They had an opportunity, they wanted it, they went for it. Does the Pakistan army have that wherewithal for change? That's a question. It's a big question. Um, the last time, you know, the army certainly do not have that intention of, you know, letting the civilians in <laughs> the uh, in the door. But um, last time, uh, a prime minister did try to intervene and did try to choose the second in command. He was, you know, that was beginning of his end. I'm referring to Imran Khan. The many uh, claim that the crisis, uh, he was thrown out of the uh, one big system because he had decided to uh, choose his own uh, ISI chief. And I would like to have your comments on that. What do you think? Oh, are we talking? Are we going to talk about Imran Khan now? Yes, we do. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, all right. I have a question. I think the moderator will let uh, questioners in uh, later. Uh, yes. I was just being interactive for a bit, but there's a question. I think there's a question. Uh, yes, there is. Uh, yes, yes, there is. All right. So, um, okay, there's a thesis here uh, by uh, Halima. The thesis is that Imran Khan's end of days started when he decided to take on. Uh, the role of the army chief, and in fact, uh, and then do what? What's your thesis? Um, decided to pick the ISI chief, so he wanted to um, wanted Kazmit to remain there. Right. Uh, but apparently, uh, sorry, uh, Kamal Javed Bhatt, so I had another choice. Okay, so uh, here's the thing. So technically, and for those of you who don't know, and you must understand the, the system and the way it works, is that. Uh, there are nine core commanders besides the chief, and then there's around seven or eight principal staff officers, right? That makes around a grand, and then there's some other guys who run uh, the administration, some other uh, some other arms, etc. So the grand total right now in this country, in our country, was well, fifth largest army has 26, 26 men, all around in the early 50s, three star generals, and. Uh, one of them is a bit of a weirdo, right? Because one of them gets to be the DGISI, right? Baki Pachis of the DGISI Ekar, because the Baki Pachis guys are supposed to report to the army chief. But this is this one strange, weird position they've made, which on paper is the purview of the Prime Minister's office. Because Inter-Services Intelligence, the directorate itself, has, as the word suggests, the different services, but also, you will be surprised to know that there are more bloody civilians inside the ISI than outside the ISI, uh, in other uh, intelligence works. It's a huge organization, and there's a lot of civilians in it, right? So, premised on that, there are more, let me repeat that, there are more civilians inside the ISI than there are uniformed serving military officers which makes it a very interesting organization for a general to run. And premised on that serious nuance, the ISI's chief is supposed to be not just picked by the uh, prime minister, but also serves at the pleasure of the prime minister. That's the rule, right? But there's a problem, as I said, because he's a weirdo, because he's supposed to do it for three years and then go back do his other job, which is assume a command position. The army has two positions in every role. If you're a lieutenant, if you're a major, if you're a colonel, captain, whatever, right up till you're a general, this, you always wear two hats. You wear a command hat, meaning you're in the field, and you wear an administration hat, meaning you have a staff duty. So technically, the ISI chief had done his uh, tenure, his three years. It was done. And it was time for the Prime Minister to say, all right, send me a list of the next few people, and then pick one. Imran didn't do that. And that is messing with a very, very old and fragile ecosystem called, uh, which is run by the military secretary, which is how the promotions and those things work. You do not do that. Just because I like you, I can't say, hey, you stick around, because it messes with the entire system. And that is only one, not the, but only one reason where it became an issue. Because Iran was really tight with general affairs. Enough has been said about this. And he thought 
that general class should just stick around forever and ever. Well, that's great, but that, what he could have done and tried to do was, well, against the, the hybrid nature of the beast that is the military, because he had to go back. That created dissent in the ranks, which is a very, uh, which the army is very paranoid about. Why was Faz getting preferential treatment by the prime minister, the other generals asked. And that's where their, their Kuku Meme went public. In fact, the army chief at that time went one step further and tweeted out that Faz has been posted out and now as a chief like that, which is not within his purview. It's technically illegal. The army chief cannot appoint the DGI side. But what you, the, we're missing the, the forest for the trees here. What Imran Khan tried to do was silly. It was silly. What the army did was illegal. There's a difference. Imran Khan's advisors, if they weren't doing what they, if they, if they knew what they were doing, would have said, bro, don't. Don't mess with these guys. Don't do it. Right? Imran Khan had already made a cardinal mistake. He was already on board of time by firing his first ISI chief, who these days is the army chief. That's another thing you don't do. You don't do it. You do it slowly. You do it in your third term. You do it after 20 years in power. All right? You do it after you know you've gone to uh, a, a lot of uh, uh, shadis and mendis of these, uh, these generals. You do it after you're in the system. You don't just come in, watch, and say, oh, my side chief, oh, you, I don't like you, go away, I'm on this guy. Right? Because I worked with him when he was a two star. You don't do that. Khan had the confidence, he thought, to pull it off. Wrong. He did. And Khan uh, repeated the same mistake, with, one can say, by trying to create pressure when uh, the uh, appointment for chief of army staff uh, was being made. Um, that, you know, I do think that uh, increased the um, differences between the two, uh, in Ram Khan and the institution. And also, do you think that um, um, the reason he's suffering right now is because of, you know, going against us, uh, us in general. So I'm, I'm not going to theorize about uh, why he's suffering right now. I think it's quite clear that uh, Pakistan's in throes of a resistant reset, which makes perfect sense if you follow my 10, 11 year uh, formula. It's time, and the system is being reset, and this new system is coming into play. And uh, let's just be very honest. Uh, those first two, three years of being on the same page, which is a term in Ran Khan uh, invented, those were critical years, and a lot could have been achieved, but it just seems that uh, Khan didn't get the basics of uh, not just the army, as we have discussed, but also regional uh, geopolitics and Pakistan's uh, uh, understanding of, and understanding Pakistan's uh, role in terms of its client state status. Khan was um, standoffish with the Americans, big no-no with the army. Khan was standoffish with the Arabs, big no-no with the army. Khan was even standoffish with the Chinese in his first six, uh, seven weeks. And his uh, finance minister, his commerce minister, had said that CPEC is, is shit. What is this? Let's open it up. And they, had, they were forced to recall. Khan went to war with everyone. Uh, internally and externally, sure, he's a firebrand, sure he came up with an uh, idea of change, but Khan was trying to do too much too soon. And the army, there's an old saying about the army, um, which, which is taught, in fact, at the staff college, that the only thing uh, which is more difficult than putting a new idea into the army is taking an old idea out of it. And the one old idea that the army clearly had is that, and still does, is that it likes to, well, uh, it likes clients. Uh, for its first uh, 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 40, 50 years, the Americans were a client. Uh, in the middle, the Chinese have been a standby client. And now, of course, as we all know, that the Arabs are a client. Khan had miffed and pissed off all three. He wasn't, uh, he's never been a systems guy. He's a my little highway guy. Voters like it. Young people like it. Women like it. Kids like it, social media like it, the Pakistan army doesn't like it. That's what you're facing. Uh, Mr. Haddad, I'd like to move on uh, from politics a little and get to you know, the issues that civilians are facing right now. 
since after blazer leads, since after 90, um, I've you know, thousands of people have been picked up. Uh, some were um, sent to military or military trials, some are just police, even when they get bail, they are arrested. Uh, one civilian that I would like, like to mention here is Khadija Shah. Uh, Khadija Shah received bail from, she's a fashion designer, she was picked up for supporting the protests on 9th May. Um, oh, she has received a bail from uh, Lahore High Court yesterday, but she's still behind bars. Um, same things, uh, same fate was uh, faced by the political leaders of PTI as well. Um, they, she was a an example. She was uh, picked up by the police. She was then um, given bail by the courts and then uh, picked up again from the jail. And this kept on going for five times and then she came out and then gave the, uh, her resignation press conference and she didn't even take some questions. And this, it's not just about Sheen A lot of the uh, second year leadership in BTI have been made to um, quit the party like this. So even when we look at the uh, at civilians, be the political leaders or be just supporters, they are all suffering. Um, what do you think the future is going to be for the civilians? And what role can courts play in here to um, intervene and to help out? So I think uh, it's firstly we need to just grapple with the political reality that the PTI has been uh, unofficially dismantled. And you need to understand what that term means. Dismantling something is literally like, you know, bit by bit, if I were to dismantle the stable, I would start with the legs. I wouldn't break it. It would be quite silly, right? I would look quite crazy and people would respond and hear me and make videos and put on Twitter without the sun and breaking the stable. You know, punching it down with an axe or a bag or a plastic bottle, you know. Can't do it, right? But I'm very stylish, specific. Let's start, for example, just screwing out the legs, right? <laughs> one by one. That seems to be what uh, the dismantling process of the PCI has been. Interview after interview, uh, we are still being subjected to with senior PCI leaders or their allies being uh, ponied around like animals um, from, a, from a horse and pony show, or a dog and pony show rather, um, being displayed, uh, being dry cleaned, and they spend 40, 50 days in incarceration. And it's not been updated. Right. And it's, it's unfortunately uh, the very fact that that's not just happening to the PTI, it's also happening uh, to other organizations. Um, which are also being dismantled, or there's even a better term, defang. Now, defanging is a very different word. Dismantling means I screwdriver things bit by bit, but defang means I take uh, your teeth out, teeth which can, um, which can bite, which can hurt me. And that's what's, for example, happened to journalism. Um, today is the uh, death anniversary of Percy of uh, my friend and colleague, Arshad Shahi, to show uh, solidarity uh, with Arshad, uh, my friend and colleague, Ali Mustafa. Uh, Arshad, Ali, and I worked together. We started our careers together. Ali Mustafa is there as well at dawn. I will like to call on him in just a bit for uh, him to share Arshad's uh, memories about Arshad, which we must dedicate a bit of tonight to. Uh, but uh, a year ago, a very sophisticated hit uh, happened. Um, and you know the story. If you don't know the story, I can recall it very quickly for you. Arshad Sharif was uh, chased out of the country through multiple FIRs. He was then smuggled with what investigators are saying was probably the military's own support system, the intelligence system out of Peshawar Gore. He was received by his friends uh, in Dubai, some of them were advisors, are advisors, serving officers of the military, and then those same guys then drove him out. Once they had built up the trust, they drove him out of the body and advised him to go to Kenya, where he was eventually assassinated on this very day. Now you'll be glad to know that Arshad's case uh, is still being pursued in one way or the other. His wife, his widow Rao has sued the Kenyan government for lack of action, but she can't sue her own government for a lack of action. Investigators of that case, there was two investigators sent, at least one of them has been put, uh, he's, he's been suspended from duty. 
there were non-military investigations. His wife has warrants out on her, his producer has warrants out on him. The case has been dragged through the courts for a year. It's an open and shut case. If you read the initial investigator's assessment of what happened. But, Arshad is not alone. We know about Imran Rias Khan, and enough has been said about him as well. We know about Khadija Shah. She was released. She, was, she got her bail this week. She got her bail after five months. She's a mother of three. And guess what they did? As soon as they got, she got the bail, they arrested her again. They asked for Imran again. For what case? Bad intentions. Bad intentions. But near me. I don't even know if that's a crime. I don't know. I look at a burger and I have a very bad intention when I look at it. I haven't eaten all day. I don't eat for fasting. I don't eat for 19 hours a day. So I have a lot of bad intentions right now. So I'm priming. Right? But very importantly, instead of making light of that, another thing happened. This is not happening in, in, in this is not just about journalists. You've heard of the MQM. The MQM's coordination committee member, Mohammed Yusuf, in South Africa, was assassinated today in Durban by two hitmen. Have you heard of that? Well, now you have. Two hitmen in Durban come in, shoot a guy, point blank, execute him while he is reading the Quran in his shop. Now, we can go on and on about the NQM. We know all about the NQM. It's not the perfect party. It's got a very violent history, but it's got support, it's got members, it's got people, some of them, one of them was shot today in that same province, in that same uh, continent, not too far away from Delhi. What's going on? What's happening in, 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 in terms of the, the what's happening in terms of the uh, the, the, the so-called assassination program, if one were to call it that? These are really, really heavy questions. I feel very unsafe. Well, I have asking like we have one more name in here, sir. Sure. During Faz, uh, General Faz, when he was the ISA chief, um, there were no activists. Can you not approach him, please? He died as well. And, um, you know, those activists have a lot of questions about those, uh, you know, that, that as well. There was another road activist who died in another country uh, mysteriously. So, um, these things have been going on historically. And I think now. Um, not historically. Recently, this has all started happening in the last, I would say, the last five or six years. They've started picking up the pace. They've started picking up the pace. There's no historic assassination program that the Pakistanis are running. There's no proof of it either. But all of this has started happening of late. You are not safe yet. I'm definitely not safe yet. So yeah, things are things are things are weird. Things are strange, and we can again every person. Every person, uh, every sector has a story. The way the corporate sector, its arms, its arms are being twisted. The way journalists are being broken or coerced or financed or purchased. And frankly, the most important argument, the elephant in the room, is a denigration of your fundamental rights. They have, I don't know how many of you are British citizens. Are there any British citizens here? Okay, so if the, which makes the rest of you Pakistanis, yes? Well, Pakistanis though are screwed, right? The Brazilian civilians. But the, the Brits, for example, if you're a British citizen, their people convened, sat down just a couple of months ago to figure out how they're going to fry you, if, in case you say something on Twitter or social media. How they can have red warrants against you. They've, they've consulted lawyers. So they're out to get everyone. They're on a roll. And again, I beg the question, where are the red lines? When will it stop? And when do we start talking about reform? Because there's no other answer. Because they're on a, they're, they're not holding back. You saw what they did to let Nawaz Sharif come back. Now, you can like Nawaz Sharif or you can hate Nawaz Sharif. I don't really care what your politics are. I care about what your legals are. And legally speaking, what he's done is unprecedented. You can't have a convicted. I don't care whether you like the known league or not. I don't care whether you like the motor or not. It's not my business to judge your politics. It is my business to judge your legality. And what he's done is highly unprecedented, pretty much illegal. And it doesn't make sense to me. Go ahead. So, 
you, you mentioned that all of us are kind of unsafe, Pakistanis especially. How come the killers of uh, uh, Ashraf Sharif are such powerful that even in other countries, for example in Britain, they have a hold in Kenya, they have a hold that they can get anybody killed. How is that possible when their own foreign policy is not that strong? I mean, you can see Pakistan. That's a very important question. I think you're, you're misphrasing it. These are not, uh, the, these, these are very powerful uh, entities. Pakistan is the largest army in the world. It's, it's the highest nuclear proliferating power. What do you mean and it's, they're, they're not powerful? What, what are you smoking, man? <laughs> what do you mean? I have, I have loved to keep going on with my questions, but we are running a bit, a bit short on time, and I would like to invite your friend, and then we can open the floor for the questions. Yeah, I would actually like uh, to give my mic for a bit to Ali Mustafa, please. And uh, Ali, if you don't mind sharing the table with me. I don't know about that, bro. <laughs> I'm a little scared. Okay. Well, uh, Ali Mustafa and I. Ali Mustafa and I. For the better part of the last, uh, we're not that old, so just several years. And, uh, and uh, Ali and I started, uh, well, Ali was my junior at Dawn, and I um, uh, started a few years ahead of him. But all three of us, Arshad, Ali, and I worked together. Ali worked especially closely with Arshad on his first breaking news story out of Islamabad, where Arshad was, uh, was reporting on the Lal Majid. Tell us about, uh, tell us a little bit about it, man. Oh, I'm scared. I don't feel really scared uh, sitting here with you today. And uh, uh, it's, it's good to have you here. I only moved here about three weeks ago. Um, and yes, Lal was it was quite a seminal uh, moment in our career. I started my journalism career in Pakistan in 2005. I'd come back from the US. And it was at the, uh, I guess it was the part of the enlightened moderation of Musharraf where he opened up the media landscape and all of a sudden you had a mosaic of uh, television channels, so Hitam Pakistan Gai, or Pakistan the Pahla News Channel, English by Pahad News, Hamdesh um, Rukia. Yeah, we lost together. Yeah. Uh, and it was quite an amazing team. It was you, there was Naveen Nakri, there was uh, Nadia Zafar, Mohammed Mohammed Shazadi, Hazar Abbas, Hazar Abbas, uh, the, uh, the brother of Major General Akhar Abbas, who was a spokesman of Pakistan military, and Zafar Abbas was the current uh, editor of Dawn in Islamabad. It's quite the dream team. And Ashish Sharif. Yeah. And Ashish yeah. Sharif was this fire, <laughs> you know, um, a man on fire, essentially. He was a firebrand. And he was so passionate. And uh, But in terms of, in his memory, I mean, um, those days are, are numbered, those days are gone. He's gone. Um, What's what's Arshad's legacy? Does it matter at this point? You uh, do you think you'll ever go back to Pakistan and launch another channel, considering what's going on? I don't think anyone in their right mind at, at this moment uh, would want to go back to Pakistan, and especially in the media in Pakistan, unless you want to compromise yourself. And we've seen this in the past few weeks. We've had grown men being paraded into studios by armed men who have sat across from them. Salaf Tata Ali Abbas, yeah, we know this guy, these people, right? But we did, did know Shahzeb, um, uh, Abu Shahzeb, uh, who followed our legacy in Japan, came from BBC. We did know people like Muni Paduk, who interviewed a man who was missing, and then Sheikh, uh, Sheikh Rashid, and then was interviewed under duress. So I don't think anyone, but going back to Ashish Sharif, I think it's, it's very important when you talk about Ashraf Sharif, and you have to give credit where credit is due in all respects. Ashraf Sharif and, and uh, myself had a falling out because of the views that Ashraf Sharif projected in service of the Pakistan military. Shahadat ke baad har bhi 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 jata hai. Lekin, jahan aur yehi baad ke maan ke asaan ki hum apna hai, hum karte hai basically, ke abhi uske saath jo hua, baad bada hua. Arshad ke saath jo hua, ho bohat bada hua. Lekin, us mokam tak pahunchne tak, Arshad ne bhi bohat sari cheezhe aisi ki, jo ab aake, ab to sukar mein lagta ta ke ho compromised hai. Uski service mein. Kiski service mein? Military ki service mein? Authoritarianism ki service mein? Aisi baat hai, aisi noh ko target karna. Lekin, at the end, uske saath kya hua? 
जिन लोगों का उसने जिन लोगों के लिए उसने प्रोजेक्शन की जिन लोगों के लिए उसने एक स्टांस लिया एंड में अलेजेडली उन्हीं लोगों ने उसे Yeah, it's, a, it's a really tragic deal, but, um, but I think this also kind of encompasses what happened in Pakistan and the media landscape in Pakistan as well. There was a lot of promise that it started off in. It weird off course over the over that time, yeah. and then it came back, and now it stands nowhere. Anyone on that screen right now is a compromised character who is only sitting there on those screens because of the um, acquiescence and the permission. Of someone much more powerful higher up. Sad words. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, at least story, my story, I should story are all different, right? But we belong to a generation of journalists who sort of saw the dream. Uh, the deregulation of Pakistani media happened around 2002, 2003. Ali came back around that time. I came back just a couple of years ahead of him. Arshad came back while he was there, but he started his TV career around that time. It's, uh, um, I mean, at this point, I could go on and on about what's wrong with Pakistani media. That is not our topic. Uh, Alima, if you don't mind joining me, perhaps you can moderate questions. Oh, but we only have one mic, so I can, uh, you can take the questions. Okay, yeah, sure, I'll, I'll take questions. Pakistan has always been considered that Musharraf opened up the media. You know, what were the journalists smoking when they thought, you know, here's a dictator and he's going to give us a voice? Okay, good question. So, uh, Pakistan electronic media revolution uh, was, whether you like it or not, baptized and christened by Musharraf. What were Pakistani um, <coughs> journalists smoking besides Marlboro's? Um, well, the thing is that Musharraf's opening up was not a isolated event, his opening up of media. Musharraf's, was, Musharraf's explanation of why he wanted to open up the media is very interesting. You should read it in his book. You should also read it, watch it in my interviews with him. Musharraf had uh, gotten his backside handed to him by the Indians in 99. 98, 99, got it. Right? In the summer of 99, the Indians uh, and the Pakistanis, those of you who don't remember or don't know, the Indians and the Pakistanis had a war very small, intense war in the mountains of Kargil. And the Pakistanis, well, they do well. Of course, the military argument is a different story. But what Musharraf was really traumatized by uh, was that the, was the lack of performance of the Pakistani press, which was at that time state-run, PTB-dominated, and didn't do much. Meanwhile, the Barkha Dats of the world, the Rajdeep Sarkasais of the world in India, on private Indian media, independent Indian media, which is a whole other story, uh, performed really well and ended up supporting the troops. And India really was galvanized, where the troops and the way they performed, the Indian troops versus the Pakistan troops became a prime time thing. And really brought that country together. Wars have a tendency to bring countries together. And the media plays a very important part in that, in the execution of that tendency. Musharraf has had admitted in his memoirs, in his interviews, that he was impressed by the way the Indian media was behaving during war. So, he said, why can't you stir up patriotism and nationalism? But, um, what he misread was that the Indian media has a very different experience with the Indian military, with the Indian state, than the Pakistani media, than the Pakistani state has with the Pakistani journalists. India is currently unsafe for journalists, but Pakistan has a long, bloody tradition of <coughs> killing its journalists. They didn't just start, Arshad is not the first, and he's definitely not the last victim of the state. If allegedly the state is involved, 
we just use that word. But the Pakistani media was more skeptical. The Pakistani media, the Indian media hasn't been lashed by dictatorship. The Pakistani, the Indian media hasn't been, been, been banished and killed, right? Which through the years, the Pakistani, the Pakistani journalist has been. So, when we were there, we saw it as an opportunity, even a little opportunity, to go for it. And guess what? We went for it. In fact, I might, might sound controversial, but if there's any other journalists in the room besides Ali and me, I must say that the freest years of Pakistani media were till we ended up playing a role in covering the judicial movement, which eventually removed Musharraf. Right? It was the black ports and the black cameras which did it, as it was called at that time. Right? Kala court, Kala camera. That was the that was the the combine, the union of those two, the judiciary and the media, which eventually removed the, the Musharraf dictatorship. So yeah, in a way, Musharraf once told me that the media was the brutus to my Caesar. I was like, you know, to be Caesar, but he didn't say that to him. But that's what he said, that you guys are more like Brutus to my Caesar. I thought, okay, as you know, Brutus was very close to Caesar. The media loved Musharraf till it did it. So, but post-judicial movement, when General Kiani took over, the way the media was and since has been handled by the military has been remarkable. And I think that the last great days of Pakistani media were around 2002-03 till 2007-08 under Musharraf, and it hasn't been the same sense, and the compromise, and the coercion, and the killings continue today. Who would you like to give the mic to? The I think the, the senior gentleman was raising So if you have touched upon the number of uh, business aspects. That's what they pay me for, sir. And uh, <laughs> what impressed me, in you know, a matter of fact, that you gave an example of Indonesia, how they brought in uh, I developed a consensus between the army and the civilians and worked out the system. You and Catherine Dazi have done a number of programs where you have talked about very openly about chances of bringing a change from within. I say, why would there be a change from within when most of the faction of politics, our faction, we find them going up at the gate number four of GHP, ready to extend help to those who matter. So the concept of bringing a change from Berlin is not going to work. What do you say about it? I'll take another couple of questions. I'll come back to you as I'll make notes. Let's change from there. Uh, let's go ahead and do some rounds of questions. Uh, hello, Dan. Uh, we have been going round in circles for like the last 75 years. So I'll get to talk at length about the facts. So what's the way forward for Pakistan as it starts? Okay, way forward. Okay. Big question. Okay. Uh, Salman, I just want to ask you, okay, uh, we saw you a lot on uh, Mahaz. You were embedded with the army, you know, some say you did propaganda for the month. Okay, you, you know, you were talking about units and weapons and, you know, JF-17 Thunder and this operation, that operation, etc., etc. But somewhere, I think 20-ish, uh, 20, 20 something like that, 20, 2019, 2020, that stopped. And then all of a sudden, Mujahid Saif Khan is not there anymore and he's not embedded with the army. What happened exactly, if you, if you wouldn't mind telling us? Okay, go on. Yeah. Hello, sir. Hello. Uh, well, I think it, uh, I mean, you already has asked a part of my question, but I still want to ask that. Uh, I know you have been in Mahaj, so how does it feel to be on Mahaj against those who claim to have a sole right to launch Mahaj against anyone they wish to? So I don't know. Can you repeat that? <laughs> my question is that how does it feel to, uh, you know, uh, to have Mahaj against those who claim to have a sole right? to launch Mahas against everyone they wish to. I mean, how does it feel? How does it feel to yeah. us? So, who are you talking about? The military, of course. You really want to know after my entire spiel, you still want to know what I think of the military, okay? All right, okay. All right. Hey, Ujjahad. Uh, when you say uh, 
that the army needs to reform from within. Uh -huh. Is there only a possibility of reform through cooperation that all of a sudden all the military actors decide they are in the mode of civil supremacy? Or is there a possibility of clash between military actors and what do you say about that? So like uh, the possibility of a clash within the military? Within the military and eventually leading to reforms. Okay. Would you like to answer these first and then I pass No, I want to keep going. Please. Okay. Okay. Um, I just want to ask, do you really think um, Imran Khan removed General Asim when he was the ICE chief? Just because he exposed his wife's corruption, do you think is that maybe the only reason why he removed General Asim? And if that is so, then how can Imran Khan say that he's not corrupt? Someone's exposing the wife's corruption, which they actually must be Good question. Hi, Udal Sab. Um, so, a bit of a different question. You've covered the battlefield on the tribal areas, Afghan border, quite a bit. So, my question is about where do you see the future of the, or where do you see Pakistan's strategy towards Afghanistan and Taliban, and how do you see that developing in the future? Is, is there Reason to be optimistic, pessimistic, just wonder your thoughts on that. Good question. Uh, so I would uh, just like you probably to take a minute and be the advocate of the army and so like stay in board there till you get home. Okay, sure. If you want me to be an advocate for the army for a minute? That's why I put my joy card on. It won't be the first time. I'm, 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 getting, I'm getting ready just a minute. It won't be the first time. Definitely not the last time. Okay. So I'm going to do my Mireya Aziz and Bhatno question in a bit. Go ahead. Yes, please. Hi. Um, my question might be a little different. Um, I've started following Pakistani politics quite recently. Welcome so, to the dark side. Yes, it's my job. Um, so what I wanted to ask was, um, I've heard a lot about um, the establishment side, the establishment being the ball, the establishment being whether you're the right person to come in or not. So my question really is, who or what exactly is the establishment? In my head, it feels like it's a dark room, it's a round table, candles are lit, and all these guys come in with quotes on, and someone has to make a decision. Exactly who makes that decision? Is that a hierarchy? I'm afraid, I'm afraid it's not that dramatic. But let's start with that. <laughs> let's start with that. That's an excellent question. I think that's the elephant in the room. Thank you for asking such a nice, pointed question. Uh, we have nine questions, right? So, uh, I don't know. We're going to try to give two minutes each and then have you guys out here uh, uh, soon. So that should cover the next 20 minutes or so. Um, the establishment is not uh, just uh, a bunch of generals. Uh, sitting around a dark room, smoking cigarettes, sitting whiskey, or in this case not, um, um, and plotting the next takeover. Uh, though the military has an outsized role in the establishment, you first must understand the very nature of the Pakistani political economy. Every country has an establishment. This country has an establishment. There are uh, all sorts of elites in every country's establishment. The country I live in, in the those great United States as an establishment. Uh, chances are that uh, to be in the American establishment, chances are you're probably white, chances are you're probably rich, chances are that uh, you probably went to Harvard or Yale, right? Um, chances are that uh, you live on one of the two biggest coasts, so you probably have um, uh, some sort of connection to Washington, you probably have some sort of lineage on this, and people come and go out of that establishment. Slowly women are being allowed in it, slowly um, X factors like Elon Musk are now in it or not. And to counter their ingress, um, people like Ina Khan, who is an anti-establishment establishment, establishment uh, actor these days, she's a very interesting character, look her up. She's heading um, the one organization which is designed to task big tech, to take it back and, and put it in its, uh, in its shape. That's, every country has a different establishment. Of course, military generals uh, in, in the US are in the establishment. Somebody called out a military industrial complex. Of course, that is establishment. If you're the CEO of, I don't know, um, General Dynamics, 
right? You are probably in the establishment because you make F-16s for a living or F-35s, right? You're definitely in the establishment, the world's most sophisticated, expensive aircraft. So the establishment is, 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 is a more morphing, moving thing. But in Pakistan, unfortunately, uh, the, the establishment doesn't include the best. The best, the power elites, the industrial elites, the academic elites, the literary elites, uh, uh, the business elites, and the military elites, of course, are supposed to be in the establishment. In Pakistan, the establishment has taken out a lot of other elites, for example, the academic elites, which you may or may not be one day, right? A lot of business elites, perhaps, you may be related to them or not. Um, uh, a lot of literary elites, uh, they're not, they've been kicked out, they've been forced out of the establishment, and the establishment has become very, very, not just military-centric, but not all military, but also very Punjab-centric, big, money-centric. The establishment is mostly men. They're mostly uh, based in, if there are corporate members there, uh, well, they happen to be probably within the, you know, perhaps Karachi, but definitely the, the, the Gujarawala, Faisalabad, Shivpura, Lahore, Sialkot, Aptabad, Combine, these are mostly Punjabi, uh, Hindu perhaps speaking families. Some of them are related to the military, some of them are not. Um, these are uh, men who uh, work with each other. Um, uh, their families are intermarried. They run, uh, you, you can look up people like uh, this Janjua chap, uh, for example, who runs uh, one of the country's biggest oil consortiums. He's men. Uh, he runs this company called Midjack. Go, go Google it tonight. That's your homework assignment to really understand how a non, non fuji non army guy becomes a part of the establishment. Go look him up, right? He's been on Navasri's side in every picture Navasri's taken in the last one week. Go look him up, right? Midjack is the name of his firm. So there's, there's, uh, there's money here. There's that whole landed uh, feudal uh, elitism here. Um, just because you're rich doesn't mean you're in the establishment. Just because, but if you're powerful, chances are you are. And there's a difference between being rich and powerful. Of course, there's hundreds of officers in the Pakistan army. But in terms of the hierarchy, it's quite clear. Currently, the army right now, this is how the army is. There's 750,000 men in the army. There's around 30,000 officers. Now, out of those 30,000 officers, there's around 26. Three star generals, two four star generals. Does it mean that all of those generals are going to be a part of the establishment? Is Asim Munir going to call up all 26 of his principal staff officers, three star generals, four commanders, and say, hey man, what do you think I should do with, uh, with Nawaz? Tell me, tell me what to do. No. No. The establishment also has a dark side, which is then the intelligence apparatus, which is a whole other conversation. But the intelligence apparatus, for example, has an establishment within, the, within it. For example, there's two sorts of army officers or military officers who work within the intelligence apparatus. There's people who come and go for three years or four years. They serve and then they leave, right? And they go back to, I don't know, their artillery battalion or their infantry battalion and they, they go buzz off, you know, doing their push ups and their sit ups, right? And jumping off aircraft, which is their day job. And they come, they, they're seconded in and out. But then the core of the intelligence apparatus has all these civilian and former retired military contractors who keep on getting extension after extension. There's people in the ISI who should have retired in the 80s who are still serving there. That is the establishment. That's the problem. There's people who retired in the 80s who are still serving there because they are the institutional core institutional memory of the intelligence organization. And perhaps that is one reason why a lot of your policies are stagnant, stale, old, not working. No, fresh blood comes and goes and enters and exits like it does in any other establishment. Money, power, this Janjua chap, this Midjack company, this Janjua chap, who you should all look up. He's definitely clearly a new member of the Pakistan establishment. I'm quite curious about him. Look him up. Midjack. That is the civilian and non-civilian parts of the establishment. And guess what? They're inter 
go walk down several road in lower Kant and you will make sense of the establishment. On the left is a polo ground where the establishment's kids are playing polo, the sons are playing polo, the daughters are watching the sons play polo, the aunties are circling with the other aunties doing the restas of the sons and daughters, the gates are open, the houses are next door, the factories are together, they're from the same brotherhood, the general staff is next to Admiral staff is next to Air Marshal staff is next to Charlie staff. Everything's safe, everybody has dogs, cats, everybody knows each other. Dinner at X's house, brunch at Y's house, intermarried, happy, safe. Not everybody's in the army, not everybody's in the navy, not everybody's in the air force, not everybody's in the establishment. That's the establishment. And you're on it. Okay, next question was uh, uh, the, well, uh, so many. Uh, General Assange's removal is an interesting question. So, um, I am not going to report at this stage uh, what, uh, uh, because I'm still working on my story, but uh, a lot of what's uh, happening currently is, may have to do, not all, but some, significantly because personal relations in a place like Pakistan where institutions are weak, individuals have more say. So in a place like Pakistan, individual opinions matter. If you don't like someone, if someone has miffed you, pissed you off, that can really change the state of play in terms of what happens in the larger scheme. There is a school of thought which thinks that Imran Khan's days were numbered when uh, Asim Mir became uh, Chief of Army Staff. But there is a school of thought which says actually Imran Khan's days were numbers when he fired Asim Mir as a three-star general um, because he messed with the system of the army. Those are two different arguments. I think that the first one is as good as the second one depending on who you talk to. But to your question, this is what happened. For those of you who don't know, the young man here asked a simple question that back in 2019, um, Asim after serving a nine-month stint, Asim as a three-star general, as the DG of the ISI, which is the Service which is Services Intelligence Director, took a recording uh, of uh, some importance to his boss, his real boss, General Marjor, in which the Prime Minister's Affiliates, I'm not going to say family, the Prime Minister's affiliates were, well, um, in uh, a morally and financially compromised position. The Prime Minister was not shown this recording, General Baja was shown this recording. General Baja said, Why are you showing it to me? Go show it to your boss. I already explained to you how the ISI works. And according to my sources, General Asim said, Sir, Really? He's like, yeah, go show it to him. Why are you showing it to me? Go. He's like, sir, are you serious? He's like, yeah, 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 I'm serious. Go. So, <laughs> General Asim then took his staff car and went across town to Islamabad to show, to have an audience with the Brown Khan, according to my source, and present him with the recordings. The Brown Khan heard the recordings and did not respond and said he will get back to General Asimani from the DGISI about the recordings. Imran did ask a few questions about where the recordings were from, etc., etc., for context, and he said, I will let you know. This was on a Thursday or a Friday, the weekend was coming. Imran Khan went under that weekend, according to my source, and went under on Friday night, Saturday, Sunday, went offline. He did not respond to his military secretary, the general at that time, Lodi, I think his name was. He did not respond to his principal secretary, Kazim Khan. He did not respond to senior minister's calls. He went under to consult with whoever he had those quarters with over that weekend. One can only assume it was 
his way. And Ram Khan emerged on Monday morning with a single line summary of firing the DGI staff. This is a story which has come out of my report. Now, what were the recordings? I'm not going to share. Who was in the recordings? I'm definitely not sharing. But did it create a shitstorm within the army? Yes. Did Imran's advisors tell him, what have you done? Yes. Did Imran stick to his guns? Yes. Did Imran get his favorite general affairs who was being primed by Bajwa at that time? said, no worry, we, we buy this guy, we get this guy. You like this guy, right? So yeah, I like this guy. Let me get this guy. Don't worry about it. <laughs> but there was reason to worry about it, as we saw. So yeah, it's a, it's a complicated story. But that, at this point, guess what? It is technically the purview of the Prime Minister of Pakistan to fire the ISI chief. He can, legally. Right? Will it piss people off? Did it? Yeah. Has there been an explanation about it? No. But the military's propaganda arm has done a remarkable job of convincing people like you that it was corruption, it was involved his family, involved his wife, etc., etc. Maybe they're right, maybe they're not. You wait till that's where you come up. But it is a questionable gap. And for someone who is so decisive, Imran Khan, so zero comp he, he calls himself like he has zero, he's, he says zero compromise uh, on um, corruption. And they haven't been back with the right. They haven't gotten anything on him on corruption. So what did this guy have that forced such a change? There's been no case on this. Mind you. There's no case. If they had a case, it would be there. If they have the recordings. So there's no case. So for me, it seems it's more of a moral issue than a legal issue. You get me? For me, Imran, rather his family, may have been more morally compromised through those recordings than legally compromised, if at all. But vice versa, there was advocate. If they have something on him, and the guy who Clearly, once in a jail, has played it to him. Where is it now? Why, why do they have him in on watches? For God's sake. And on ciphers, which have already been published. So, it's an interesting story. Why did Asim Ali piss off Imran Khan enough for Imran Khan to go away, literally, stop picking up phones, go back to Bani Gala, not talk to anyone, emerge over the weekend and say, all right, you're fired. Something happened. Wait for the story. Um, okay, so that's the that's the Asim Ali question. How, how much time do we have? Just a few more minutes. What's a few more minutes? Um, I would say that because we started late, I would say just less than forty-five. Oh yeah, yeah. Let's let's. Okay, so are you guys having fun? Or you, yeah, you no, 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 no. All right. <laughs> okay. Okay. So uh, Afghan strategy. Acha, good question. Okay, so the Afghan strategy uh, is flawed. Uh, the uh, reporting on the ground is really, really difficult right now, but here's what we know. Uh, you're looking back at uh, uh, the numbers of sustained violence, which are equivalent in, in the border areas, which are equivalent to the 2006-07 surge uh, during Musharraf's time. Uh, you're looking at uh, maybe about 10,000 insurgents now trained and armed with uh, NATO weapons. Um, you're looking at um, a situation which you haven't seen in the last 15, 20 years. 15 years. The difference between this insurgency, this surge in the insurgency, versus that initial insurgency, is uh, firstly that the TTP, as well as its other branches, uh, have more numbers, there's more of them. They have more better weapons because of the weapons left back and then purchased uh, by NATO. But most importantly, they have a template. They have a template from the TTA, which is the Afghan Taliban. The Afghan Taliban have defeated the world's mightiest military alliance. And they've done it comprehensively. And they've done it through a system not just of fighting, but they've done it through a system of governance and shadow governance. Right now, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, uh, the TTP didn't have uh, 
shadow governors, shadow magistrates, uh, shadow provinces. Shadow, they do have, they do have them now. In, they have, in Pakistan, they have shadow districts. Now that's something the TTA did very well in Afghanistan, but they've copied that template. How are you different? Today? That's how they're different. How are you different? Today? You are different because, first of all, you're the only star in the region. In fact, you're the only country in the region. Is that, who's, who else in the region? Let's do a quick count, right? Iran, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Kazakhstan. All the stars are in Iran. None of them, after the, Afghan, the American pull out of Afghanistan, have seen the surge of violence that the Pakistanis have seen since 2021 August when the Americans pulled out. Pakistan is the net net loser. Even in Afghanistan, violence has gone down and terrorism has gone down. So Pakistan is the net net loser of all the stars, including Afghanistan and Iran, after the American pull out. The since 21 versus 23, the rise in casualties is double figure uh, spikes. The rise in incidents is triple figure spikes. Pick uh, anything, tag, and they'll tell you this. Firstly, so you're the net net loser number one, which really we should all go back and, 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 and light one up and think about what did we do wrong over the last 40 years for this to happen. That's one, but there's other differences as well. You're weaker economically for a full scale, and to tackle a full scale insurgency. You don't have the largest of NATO and American weapons and American aid coming in, which you did 10, 15 years ago. More than anything, the big X factor is that you don't have the support of the Pakistani people, which is vital in fighting an insurgency. Insurgencies are fought with the citizens of any country, any village, any town, any city. And the military is in a very, very difficult spot because People don't like it. We can go on and on about why they don't like it. We already have gone and on about why they don't like it. So the military is in a tricky spot. It doesn't have American largesse. It doesn't have international aid weapons coming in. It's looking at a mightier uh, foe, which is better trained now, which is a hard which is more. But the two common, the one common thing between both of them, they're both battle hard. Because the current generation of Pakistani generals, which is now coming up, has just been some major two-star major generals who have been promoted. These guys have seen frontline action. Right? They were your age when this war started, 15, 20 years ago. Right? And they're just young generals right now. You're looking at that. You're looking at a very fierce level of Pakistani general right now. You should go look up. I did a show on it. You should look up that show. There's a lot of generals who were recently superseded. A lot of them have uh, red tabs and yellow tabs. They've, 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 they've lost a lot in action. Forget men, they've been hit in action. So uh, a lot of those generals who are uh, uh, heroes of the war, the first war, uh, have been superseded. But, but every general recently who's been made a three-star general right now in this country, there's been three or four who have promoted I did a show on it, check it out, um, is, a, is, a, is a veteran of the war. Are you suggesting that the Taliban um, uh, movement is more democratic than... I think it represents the people of Taliban. Well, uh, are you talking about the Afghan Taliban or the Pakistani Taliban? I'm talking about the Taliban. That's not my subject. I'm not here to debate the Afghan Taliban. It's not my subject. I didn't say that either. I didn't say that the Afghan Taliban, but I'm to break, break the break, the Afghan Taliban are not democratic. There are a lot of things, but they're not democratic. No, you just said they're They need a one-man strong. I didn't say that. For 40 years. I, 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 wish, I wish I had the goal to say that. I didn't say that we need a one-man system running for 40 years. you gave examples earlier. I, I, I'm, I'm, I, I love giving examples. I did not make that claim. But anyways, we can circle back. Let's talk offline. Let's, let's, let's connect with the questions which were asked earlier to keep the momentum going. Um, Yeah. Okay, we're, we're going to take the last one, I think. I'm sorry, we can't take all of them. I'll just take a general one. It was asked by a gentleman here as well and there as well, the way forward. 
Yeah, is that a good question to end on? Okay. Why doesn't she ask now and I can wait forward in the end? She, I was watching that day, you were good with another uh, show. She doesn't speak English. Islam way from Jim. Yes, I am. I can get the same. So she was actually, she was asking the other day, so we were talking about Imran Khan, and she was saying, Coach, you know, Imran Khan, that he went. Same question. And then I said, you were standing here, you were standing here, you were standing here. Because I told her, I said, he's coming himself, why don't you ask, go ahead and ask John. So the question is, Imran Khan, that he went. I said, Imran Khan, that he went. But you can answer the question. I think I will do my job. Okay, so I have to take this question. Imran Khan, is what, who is, in the two or three formula that we discussed, Let's break those formulas down. We'll go to work now. One is saying that Khan Sahib was 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 ये मेरा ख्याल है ये हालिया हिस्ट्री में सबसे अंडरस्टडीड किस्म का सासनेशन है वो बंदा कौन है उसका नाम किसी को याद अब मैं अभी आपको बात बाई वर ड्रेक आई कैन इमेजिन उस बंदे का नाम कास या वो कार है मैं खुद भूल गया ड्रेक पर इट्स वन ऑफ द ट्यू व्हिच इज व्हिच इज वेरी इंटरेस्टिंग क्� पाकिस्तान के रिसेंटली इलेक्टेड और आउटस्टेट प्राइम मिनिस्टर सबसे दुनिया की पाकिस्तान की हिस्ट्री में सबसे फेमस पाकिस्तानी पे गोलियां चलाई हैं वो बंदे का नाम ही बोल दिया उस बंदे को गायब कर दिया गया उसे केस किधर इसको पता है चल रहा है इसे रिपोर्टिंग हो रही है नहीं कोई खड़ा हो रहा ह� किधर अच्छा फायदे में चार और लोग लाइक अरेस्ट हुए थे उसमें से दो लोग पीएमएल में उनके सोशल मीडिया टीम के थे दो पीपल आपने अरेस्टेड उनका नाम मुझे बता दो मैं आपको घर ले लूँगा आ ब्लैक का है लेकिन अभी बड़ी जब पार्टी बेहतर है राइट बट बट ऑन दैट नोट एक तो लगता है मॉडल फेयर इधर लगता है � फिर आता है बोटो मॉडल, बोटो मॉडल आपको पता है क्या है? मगर बोटो की रूह अभी ज़्यादा है, राइट महंगी पड़ती है, राइट तो जो बोटो मॉडल है, वो मुझे नहीं लगता। आज बोटो मॉडल के जो अच्छा बोटो मॉडल के नीच व्यापारी हैं, उनके काम हो सके, क्योंकि जो आज कोर्ट्स ने किया है मिलिट्री � जो मूव की थी वो चीज कि मिलिट्री ट्रायल नहीं मिलिट्री ट्रायल जो है पाकिस्तान की तारीख में हालिया तारीख में ऑपरेशन राय रास राय अंजाद के जमाने में आते हैं आपके तो पिशावर पब्लिक स्कूल अटैक और वो मेदूद मदद के लिए बाजी वो मेदूद मदद के लिए फौज को यह हक मिला था कि लोगों का मगर दहशत करों का ट्रायल मगर आप फौज कह रही है कि तू भी दर्शन इमरान भी दर्शन कर रहे हैं क्योंकि ये सेफर बेस्ट है और वो खदीजा शाह भी शायद दर्शन कर रहे हैं क्योंकि पीटीआई के झंडा नजर आती है ये हाथ आज उसे ले लिया है तो जो बुटो मॉडल है कि ड्रावर्स अंडर कस्टडी सजा सजा मौत है वो उसकी भी आज चांसेस मोर्सी मॉडल होगा जो मिसर के सदर के साथ हुआ था उनको सजा हो गई थी सजा के बाद एक केस पे दूसरा केस पिंजरे में खड़ा करके उसका केस करते थे और फिर वो उसी पिंजरे में एक दिन उसे खड़ा करा अटैक हो गया उसकी जेल में लोगों ने कहा स्लो पॉइज नहीं है लोगों ने कहा जल्दी है लोगों ने कहा टॉर्चर है चौथा मॉडल ऑब्वियसली जो बहुत लोग कहते हैं कि इसके साथ मैंडेला वाला किया जाएगा या बच जाएगा वो हीरो बन के वापस आएगा मैंडेला पैंतीस साल की है जेल में था जवानी में क्या इसके पास सॉरी ऐसा वो कान मुझे पैंतीस साल नहीं 
تو ایسے زندگی ماں تو اللہ تعالیٰ کے ہاتھ میں اس کا ایک اور مسئلہ ہے اس پارٹی کو نیچے سے جیسے توڑ دیا گیا ہے اس کی کوئی بیٹے نہیں ہیں بیٹی نہیں ہیں جو سیاست میں انوالو ہوں اس کے آدھے لوگ ادھر 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 ہو گئے ہیں تو اس ویری ڈیفیکلٹ ٹو سے کہ پی ٹی آئی نے آج پھر مینشن کرنے کی کوشش کی ہے آج اور ان کو مارا گیا ہے ان کی سی سی ٹی ویز ان کے لوگوں کو ریسٹ کیا گیا ہے حالانکہ جو کل ہوا رہا ہے لاہور میں مینار پاکستان میں وہ بھی ایک الیکشن رہا ہے انہوں نے بھی اجازت لے کے الیکشن کی ریلی کرنے کی کوشش ریلی تو نہیں ایک چھوٹا سا میٹنگ کرنے کی کوشش کی ٹارگیٹ کیا گیا تو کلیئرلی نظر آ رہا ہے کہ عمران خان کا اس سائیکل میں کوئی اس سائیکل میں کوئی چانس نہیں ہے مگر دو ایکس فیکٹرز ہیں ایک شارٹ ٹرم ایک لانگ ٹرم شارٹ ٹرم ایکس فیکٹر ہے کہ جوڈیشری جس نے آپ شکر ادا کا کہ تھوڑی سی غیرت اور دان دکھانا آپ نے شروع کیے ہیں شاید جوڈیشری کچھ کرے آج کیا ہے اس نے شاید کل کچھ کر دیں جزوں کو کوئی نہیں جز تو بالکل ایکس فیکٹر ہے کوئی نہیں دیکھ سکتا کوئی نہیں پروڈکٹ کر سکتا اور دوسرا جو ایکس فیکٹر ہے وہ یہ ہے کہ آسم امیر یا اس کو کوئی بار سے کوئی انٹرنیشنل اسٹیبلشمنٹ کا کوئی بندہ بندی سے کہہ کہ یار بس ہو گئی یا اس کے خود کمانڈرز اسے بولیں یا خود اسے خیال ہے کہ بس زیادہ ہو گیا ہے یا اس کے جانے کے بعد اگلا جو چیف ہے اگر عمران جب تک زندہ ہو حیات ہو فنکشنل ہو بول سکے جب تک گاڈ نوز ہوتا ہے اس کے بعد شاید اگلے آپ نے چیف کی بارے میں کیونکہ ایز بی ایف ڈسکس پرسنل جو لائکنگ اور ڈس لائکنگ ہیں وہ عجیب سی ہوتی ہیں اگر آپ کو یہ بندہ پسند ہے آپ پاکستان کی ادھر ادھر پالیسی آپ ادھر ادھر شفٹ کر سکتے ہیں بیکاز انسٹیٹیوشن جو ہیں وہ انڈیویجولس ڈومینیٹ کر تو اب بٹ ان دا شارٹ ٹرم جس طریقے سے نواز شریف کی واپسی ہوئی ہے اسے دلہے کی طرح رسیو کیا ہے براتی لایا ہے وہ گھوڑے پہ آیا ہے وہ گھوڑے کے گھوڑے پہ اور جہیز لایا ہے بہت سارا ساتھ عربیوں کے وہ ڈالر لایا ہے ہندوستانیوں کا وہ کرکٹ کو ڈول لایا ہے اور آپ کا نکاح پڑھا ہے سارا ہے سر زوری زوری میاں کے ساتھ افغان